we are live. Welcome to 1980s Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back, Review and Thoughts. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a sequel to an iconic film came out and proved the first one wasn't a fluke. Yeah, this is my favorite of the films. So I rewatched the episode four, let's see, three days ago. And, you know, it had only been three weeks since I watched it for reviewing it since last time I watched it. Yet again, loved watching it. It's, I, I will never tire of these movies. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. Now, I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. And... Let's see. So yeah, I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so verbally, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead, which is to see me lower my index finger. At most, I will I will be spoiling the, the first movie. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie. I will not be spoiler, spoiling later entries in the franchise. So, content warning and or trigger warning for torture, kidnapping, ableism slash disability, Gaslighting, xenophobia, let's see, murder, body horror, and minority, abuse of minorities. Now, the movie is rated PG, and let's see. The movie's rated PG, and so is this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I streamed this movie. I did so I didn't I didn't have to pay extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video. It's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing, the first movie. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are for criticisms based on budget, what it came out, what you're trying to achieve. I'm not sure I'm actually going to be saying very many negative things about this movie, but now that is out of the way. In a lot of ways, this movie is like episode four, so I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar, except when I might comment on differences. I'm going to talk about the ways... Yeah, I'm going to be focusing on the, the differences from one another so that I'm not just repeating myself. And yeah. The only thing you need to have watched in order to follow this movie's plot is episode four. And like with episode four, I first watched this decades ago. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be criticizing this movie based on things that it couldn't have done based on like, you know, the, the special effects and and such i'm you know i at most will compare it to other movies that came out right around that same time i'm not going to uh, yeah now since we're still dealing with corona i want to say during this video it is possible that i will touch my face i want to assure you i washed my hands since the last time i was outside and i will wash my hands again before going out now, I, the, the version that I base this review on is the Disney Plus one, and as far as I can tell, it is the most recently of the altered ones. I think in some countries you can, on Disney Plus, watch 
the not quite the theatrical cut I wish but you know one one of the ones that hasn't been messed with all that much but yeah you know if if, if you can if you have access to multiple different versions definitely get as close to the original theatrical cut as you can get I don't have an exact count for how many times I've watched this. It's in the dozens. It's at least 25. My first viewing was in the year 1999. So, so yeah, this is one of those movies that I first watched it years and years ago. For years, I didn't have access to it. And now that I have access to it again, that's why I'm doing the video on it now. Otherwise, I would have done it years ago. But... Yeah, I wasn't doing video. I was not recording YouTube videos in the year 1999. But yeah, I've been wanting to do a video on this movie for years. And my most recent viewing was, you know, pretty much right before I started recording this. Like, I, I had lunch in between and recorded a video talking about the What If episode that premiered early this week, you know, Wednesday, but other than that, yeah. Now, plot. Years after the events of A New Hope, the Galactic Empire discovers the new rebel base on the ice planet Hoth and attacks. Several major characters do manage to escape alive. Luke travels with R2-D2 to Dagobah, a swamp planet where Luke can receive further Jedi training by Jedi Master Yoda. Ben Kenobi hand-picked Yoda for training Luke. Han, Leia, and C-3PO try to flee in the Millennium Falcon, but they experience some difficulties getting it to hyperspeed, which, yeah, so they, they are in, a, in significant danger from the Galactic Empire. The plot remains interesting throughout and never stands still. The, the first movie was an introduction to this vast universe, and this is a further adventure in it, an expansion of it, new worlds, creatures, and technologies. And, yeah, like with the first one, this set new standards for what you could expect from, you know, a, a fun sci-fi action movie. And for, for this movie, George Lucas continued to write the screenplay, but he was simply too stressed to continue directing, and Irvin Kirshner, R.I.P., take, took, took over. Now, let's, yeah, and, and this con continues the theme that being in touch with nature and channeling what is natural is superior to technology. And the movie was definitely well worth making. The movie has a really excellent balance of like style and substance. And yeah, so let's see the in my opinion this is superior to episode 4 but it is close and I can understand those who prefer episode 4 I definitely think it's it's better than episode 6 but again it's been years since I watched episode 6 the last time maybe I will have a higher opinion of it this time and Yeah, you know, based on the, the last time I watched the, these movies, my least favorite Star Wars movie was uh, Phantom Menace. And, yeah, so, it's, it's a really great title, The Empire Strikes Back, because that underlines that this is the Empire, well, striking back at the Rebel Alliance after the major win for the Rebel Alliance. At the end of a new hope the empire refuses to allow any further losses to the rebel alliance and really in the first movie they weren't really they were they were looking for the rebel base 
they knew that they there there might be it might be dangerous and risky to them if they didn't stop the the droids with the the death star plans and the <clears throat> That was, yeah, you know, but they, they did think that things would work out well because they had the Death Star. And then the movie ends with the good guys destroying the Death Star. So that's, yeah. And, and in this movie, they're basically like, well, now we know exactly who... Like, they're, they're very specifically going after, like, the opening crawl specifically says that Darth Vader is now obsessed with Luke Skywalker, which you could understand, you know, dude turned off his targeting computer and then, you know, perfectly nailed the, the one shot he had at the, you know, the countdown was, had reached its end if he didn't hit it with this shot. There would be no way for them to stop the Death Star and and save the excuse me and save the the rebel base and yeah like for for this entire movie the Empire is working really diligently to stop all of the our you know all the the major characters from the first movie that survived and yeah it it's you know I, I talked about in the in the video I made for the first movie that the you know the Galactic Empire are supposed to be like fascists and this movie is basically like this is what it looks like if a fascist you know, government and, and military are trying to, you know, to catch you and kill you. Now. I mentioned in my review of the first one that the movie doesn't stop and explain everything. You pick up things from content clue, context clues and some things you just have to accept without understanding them. This one does the same thing, but it adds a few things, including that now stuff happened between the two movies. Honestly, way too few sequels do this. It really, like, the audience can accept that something happened that we didn't see. You just have to handle it right. But, yeah, th this one... It, it does a, an incredible job with that. Now, this was written by George Lucas, who, you know, the, the other of his work that I'm familiar with are the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy, THX 1138 and American Graffiti. Lee Brackett, RIP, and this is the only thing she wrote that I watched. And Lawrence Kasdan, who also wrote, you know, yeah, Return of the Jedi, streamlined the story, tightened up the dialogue, and deepened the character relationships. And he did an incredible job on that. It really, like, the, the script for this is better than the script for A New Hope. Overall, again, in a lot of ways, A New Hope has a really strong script. Now... Since this one splits up the team slightly by taking Luke away from the rest, it of course needs to make interesting both Luke's journey of exploration and the other group's physical danger. Ideally, when it cuts from one to the other, the movie should leave, shouldn't leave leave you frustrated and just wanting it to stay. I think it does incredibly well at this. Now, let's see. Films and stuff said in Empire Strikes Back, perfect structure. The first one, the trio, are strong together, so this film splits them up, threatening the core, and that's a big part of why the film is as good as it is. And that really is, like, for sure, for a lot of the first one, Leia is not with, you know, the, the others, but once 
Luke and, and Ben hire Han and Chewie, you know, for a lot of the movie, the, the, yeah, Han, Chewie, Ben, C-3PO and R2-D2 are together, and once the, once Leia, you know, they get her out of the cell, and then she does a lot to help, you know, get all, all of them out of there, and then they, you know, once they get back to the Falcon, then, like, basically, the, the rest of the movie, they are together, although, like, Han seems like he's leaving, and Leia and, and C-3PO are not physically in the same place as Luke, but, you know, the, they're on the, the radio, they're not, and, and they have the, the same goal, and they are focusing on, but, you know, here, like, they have the same overall goal, but they have very different approaches to it, you know, the, the man, the movie handles plot twists really well, there are not too many, they're very good, there are also not too few, they're not too easy to figure out for the viewer, and it's not one of those movies that works only until you learn the twist ending and then completely falls apart. And you also, you don't need to, like, get Wikipedia, which is good, because Wikipedia and the internet did not exist when this movie came out. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, like, if you watch it more than once, when you watch it knowing the the you know, some of the twists, you will appreciate certain things on repeat viewings, but you can just watch it once and you'll understand. It is very unlikely that anyone today will go into this movie not knowing the major twist, but even so, the movie does such a great job building up to it that it's really effective if you get into the movie. You know, the first time I watched this, I knew the twist. I it's it's extremely difficult to avoid the the learning but i it it's still oh yeah like like i said when i did the video for episode 4 the very first time i watched these movies they didn't they didn't completely hit you know for me but the on repeat viewings, well, I, I started to really appreciate how great they are. So the direction is very focused and yeah, I already mentioned Irvin Kirshner directed it. The only other things I've seen him buy are Robocop 2, which I rate a 6 out of 10, and Never Say Never Again, which I honestly don't remember. I, I must have watched it. Because I've seen every Bond movie between and including the first one and Goldeneye. So yeah, I, I must have watched it, but I really don't remember it at all. Now, Lucas was the one who came to Kirshner with the idea. It wasn't Kirshner's own idea. And at first he actually wasn't like, what's the word? At first he was very reluctant, but once he really got, once he realized how he could, yeah, he, he realized that he could make it a really compelling movie. He didn't want to do something that was just about special effects, and yeah, he's, he succeeded. The movie, while having really strong special effects for the time, it is not just about the effects. And so the opening of the movie you know, very very early on, we get the Battle of Hoth, and it is epic. It's absolutely incredible. 
I'm going to very briefly quote one of my fellow critics here. The opening battle around the ice planet is marvelously intense, especially as witnessed from the cockpits of rebel fighters taking on thickly armored Imperial walkers. And the opening crawl is, again, excellent. Like, the, it has the information it should and doesn't have stuff that wouldn't be... Ah, what's the word? Yes, things that would distract. I, f I forget if this is one of the movies that... But, but certainly, Episode 4 had problems with the title opening crawl at first. I think the video, the YouTube video is called How Star Wars Was Saved in the Edit. And they, like... You you get some details about what was originally in the opening crawl of the yeah New Hope and yeah it I I can I can kind of understand where they were coming from but I'm really glad they changed it because it would not have been anywhere near as big of a phenomenon if it yeah. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad but. I will say it fits with what came before. I'm extremely happy with the end. I, th I think it is an incredible end. It's one of the strongest movie endings. It doesn't have to rely on Deus Ex Machina, other convenient writing. And the ending titles are also a, a strong strong sequence. The movie never loses your interest. I wouldn't really say that there are parts of it that are more enjoyable to watch than others. For sure there is like the 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 different parts are different. There's a very different dynamic like when when Luke is being trained by Yoda you know that's one thing and then when you see Leia and Han you know on the Falcon trying to evade the Empire that really is very very they have very different atmosphere and it's it's very impressive that it intercuts so well. Like, if it was off by just a little, it wouldn't work. Like like it could, yeah. It 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 could really completely sink the movie. That the, yeah. And as a sequel, it does a really great job building on the world and the characters that were introduced in the first movie. I really appreciate that Leia continues to be a badass. And here she gets more chances to, she, you know, in the first one she spends a chunk of it in, in a cell. And, yeah. And in this movie, we see more of what can be done using the Force. And it uses the power as well. There's a decent amount of Force power use. It's easy to follow. There isn't too much of it. Now, the, the characters... Yoda says at one point that he's been training Jedi for 800 years. Now, I don't think it's going to shock anyone when I point out that the actor doing the voice, Frank Oz, and, and the puppeteering, is not more than 800 years old. But the quality to the voice and the, the sort of it's not really cynicism, but there's a frank quality to him. Like, he's 
he's kind of done trying to like you know if if he thinks something is a certain way he's not necessarily going to like just very gently break it to he might spell it out you know and yeah like the way he sounds and s a, a number of the things he says really feels like yeah this this is what someone who had you know not only lived for that long but trained jedi for that long that is it's not easy and and the movie once again generates empathy for leia luke yoda han and the droids and like Darth Vader is really intense and and the kind of just what's the what's the word we we love to hate him he he really is just overpowering now Mark Hamill playing Luke Skywalker Luke gets substantially more Jedi training in this one since there isn't anything getting in the way and that allows us to see more of his strengths and weaknesses. Harrison Ford as Han Solo has a lot of great lines, one-liners, he's really badass. He does want to help the Rebellion but on the one hand Jabba the Hutt still has a bounty on his head and on the other he's so used to being on his own he doesn't want to accept being there for others maybe he kind of worries that he'll let them down or that they'll eventually reject him and Carrie Fisher as Leia Organa Yeah, I already mentioned she's she's still really badass. She gets to to you know when when there is a fight, she gets involved and she yeah she she's really good at strategy. And David Prowse plays the the yeah the the body of Darth Vader. We find out more about him, and he is a continued sinister, intense presence. I'm pretty sure he has more... Yeah, yeah, he has more screen time in this one. In the first movie, he was kind of on Grand Moff Tarkin's leash, but this time, there is nothing slowing him down, so he does what he wants, and it is terrifying. And just... Yeah, like... There are so many movies that wish they had a villain just like a tenth as intense as Darth Vader is. And Billy Dee Williams is incredibly charismatic. I Yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about this. And... With with C-3PO, R2-D2, and Chewbacca, we again see their humanity, that they're not just, you know, like, there's more to C-3PO than his, his skills. Chewbacca isn't just a mindless animal. And, yeah, R2-D2 has a lot of personality. Yeah, so more on Yoda. You really get to see how strong the force he is, and his training methods are sometimes unusual, but you can see how they would get really great results. Others have already pointed out that it's ridiculous that it works. Everyone watching the movie knows that it is a puppet, 
and apparently when they were making it, Frank Oz and Mark Hamill could not hear one another. They could deliver their lines, but they couldn't hear what the other one was saying. The fact that when you watch it, it legitimately feels like Yoda is real, that these are simply two living beings that are communing, communicating with each other smoothly, is a testament to the professionalism and talent of the actors, puppeteers, Irvin Kirshner, and the editors. And actually, a puppet was one of the only special effects, special effect types, not seen all that much in episode four. You know, I'm, I'm not saying we didn't see it at all. I'm saying not all that much. There wasn't a major character that was, you know, a puppet. Now, the, the dialogue is really great. It conveys characterization and exp exposition quite well. And the characterization, you know, Luke, Leia, and Han, we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong which really helps, yeah, you get a really strong sense of who they are. Of the various things with this movie that stay with you long after watching, the ending is the, the, the top spot. You know, it, it does such a great job delivering on what it has built up. Now, the cinematography was handled by Peter Sushitsky. I am not, I'm not familiar with all of his work, but he's worked with David Cronenberg a number of times. And um, Lucas actually wanted to work with Sushitsky on the first one, but he was unavailable. Since he didn't like working with Gilbert Taylor, the actual DP on episode 4, he convinced Kirshner to bring in Sushitsky. And Sushitsky had great ideas for how to film Vader, like the helmet, which is why it looks so much cooler here. In the first one, it was more the design than the lighting that looked good on the helmet. He also greatly improved how the lightsabers looked by bringing in a different approach. It's kind of technical, so I won't get into it here, but yeah, just like if, 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 if you're not sure exactly what kind of impact of a good DP can have on a movie, compare the strong, but not quite as good cinematography of A New Hope to Empire Strikes Back. Now, the editing was handled by T.M. Christopher, Paul Hirsch, George Lucas, and Marsha Lucas. And the, yeah, the, the fact that, like, you have all of these scenes that go from, like, from, you know, b between these very different environments with these very different characters, in very different situations, you know, like, at, Luke knows that the Rebellion needs help, you know, in, in the long term, but, like, currently he's training, you know, he's, he's trying to be, become a better Jedi so that he can better help the Rebellion, whilst the, you know, Han, Leia, C-3PO, and, and Chewbacca are on the Falcon and constantly worried about 
the the uh, yeah the the empire so it it's it should not work anywhere near as well as it does now the the special effects are impeccable Lucas had the crew push themselves to the limit and it shows a big time the opening battle on Hoth was in part there to challenge the special effects team in the first movie you know a, a lot of the special effects are ships in space so there was you know the, this black background that you could hide strings in but Hoth is an ice planet so you have to be extremely careful that there are no strings shadows you know the the yeah and anything that other than what's supposed to be in the movie and another challenge was the outer space dogfights which again you know when when you compare like in the first one the the maneuvers pulled by the the space craft were nowhere near as like there wasn't the the i guess it's probably not called dexterity when it's for a vehicle but I, th I think you know what I mean the, the flexibility the budget was 33 million and the box office was 550.9 million so yeah it it was successful now the production the design is great. The The rebel base on Hoth is in a cave and there's this series of tunnels dug into the mountain. It's incredibly convincing. And Dagobah, the swamp planet, has incredible attention to detail. These places feel like they actually exist and that people could go there. You wouldn't necessarily love to live there, but hypothetically it's a place you could go and yeah, like the the again it feels like like when you see the swamp you believe that there are creatures that could live there, thrive there. You know, they're probably not very similar to us. We wouldn't do well there, but there is life there. It doesn't feel like a set which you know, I've I've seen behind the scenes footage like it's a set. There's a there's a border and you know they're just they're careful to never film past the border and yeah it's it's unreal how convincing it is and the first movie introduced us to the star destroyer which is massive it's in fact you know the very opening of the movie is this like small spaceship and then the star destroyer you know following it this movie introduces the Super Star Destroyer, which is way bigger, and it's just, it's wild. And, I mean, you would think that the second time they do this kind of thing, like, two movies in a row, both of them introduce us to a massive ship. You'd think the second time around, we'd be like, yeah, okay, we've seen this one before, George, let's... What else you got, you know? But no, it it's awe-inspiring. Now, the exterior Hoth scenes were actually filmed in Norway, which, yeah, if you've if you've been near Norway, you know that you know a lot of lot of snow and ice in in the yeah. The first movie makes mention of multiple planets, but ultimately we only actually visit one, Tatooine. Where in this, we visit Hoth, Dagobah, and at least one more. I 
won't be saying exactly that. And in the first one, we mainly saw the insides of multiple ships. We still do get that here as well. And again, we see the insides of ships that were not in the first movie in this one. And they do a good job on the, like, costumes. Both the Rebel Alliance and Galactic Empire have uniforms specific for fighting in the snow. And, in, in fact, the, the troopers that are, the, the Galactic Empire's troops for fighting in the snow are referred to as snow troopers instead of storm troopers. And, yeah, it makes perfect sense. You know, you see what they're wearing, and it's like, yeah, I mean, they need something to withstand the, the extreme cold, and yeah, you know, and, and the, yeah, the Rebel Alliance uniforms, you know, the, the, they look like they would be, they, they do a pretty decent job of keeping you, keeping you warm, even though it's insanely cold outside. And I'm almost certain they actually were because they were literally they were worn by actors outside in in snow, you know, filming these scenes for hours at a time. So yeah. And the action. Yeah, the 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 battle on Hoth includes these massive vehicles sometimes referred to as walkers in some ways they're similar to tanks but instead of tank treads they move with these large legs they're in part inspired by elephants and seeing the move is a sight to behold and that's again like we've seen just like tanks we've seen tanks we've seen sci-fi tanks before but like this elephant inspired kind of thing, yeah and it's clever that they have legs instead of tank treads since that can actually be a problem for tanks if they're if there's too steep of a hill they just can't go there some people say that the walkers move too slowly first of all they're still extremely efficient second of all the empire being large slow and menacing is part of the point they're so obsessed with being stronger that they fail to realize that it's actually a problem for them. They end up making mistakes because they put so much stock in being strong and destructive. Now, yeah, so, brief spoiler for the battle on Hoth. So, if you don't want to know, mutants can be heading to seeing a little man dick's finger. I agree that it doesn't make sense that they're so easy to blow up once they've fallen over. I think I kind of see what people mean about like, oh, you know, once they're fallen over, the the like the neck is very exposed and that's what they're shooting at. Could they really not have at least tried shooting at them? They they kind of fly almost di directly at them instead of like you know, if you played Shadows of the Empire, at least the demo, I don't know about the rest of the game, but the demo has, like, two or three levels that make up the Battle of Hoth. And, yeah, if you fly towards them, you get destroyed. You have to fly around them. Anyway, yeah. I've always thought that it should, you know, it should be like in any American movie where if a car, like, flips on his side or something minor it blows up that that should be how they get destroyed anyway no more spoilers for the time being now their name is spelled a t dash a t i have heard that the official pronunciation is not a t a t but at at which to me sounds way too much like you're trying to suppress a sneeze and we are dealing with corona. Look, I don't make the rules. I just think them up and write them down. I will be referring to them as AT-ATs. It's not a horror movie, but there are a few legitimately scary scenes, like with the first one and 
yeah, that's, they're really, really effective. Like, this is, you know, if, if a lot of time passes between two viewings, you might forget how scary it is and the, the sort of the details of some of the scares. But yeah, there are some very scary aliens in this. Now, the let's see, the yeah, the the movie yeah, the scenes are easy to follow. They're meant to, and I think that was the right choice. So yeah, the the music is again handled by John Williams. And the score is yet again fantastic. Williams adds to what he created for A New Hope. This introduces the Imperial March, which does an incredible job of making the Empire even more intimidating. That's again something that you might forget if a while passes without you watching these movies, the Imperial March never plays in A New Hope, and it's right to introduce it with this movie, because this is when the Empire gets even more intense. You know, both of these movies, there is this constant sense of dread of having to stay, stay alive despite the efforts of the Empire. So the the comedy we again have slapstick and other silly stuff, for example, with droids. Keeping in mind I use silly as a neutral descriptive term, not a negative one. I don't think it's a problem that they have that. I, I think the movie I suppose an argument could be made that they could have done it in other ways. But if you took out all of the silly humor from this movie, it would be too dark. It would just be too... Just, yeah, you wouldn't have any fun while watching it. And the tone gets darker. There are multiple times, you know, since the first... Based on... From the first one, yeah. There are multiple times where things seem to be going well with the movie. And, and then the movie will suddenly pull the rug out from under you, every bit of good luck is tempered with anxious anticipation that things will go wrong. And, and this should, the movie should end up, logically, should end up being, like, frustrating and exhausting, because every time something good seems to happen, something bad happens, and you would think that we'd be like, okay, we get it. Now, just do something different. It's, you know, it, it should get tedious. Somehow it doesn't. Like, it's, it's remarkable. Now, parts of this are less focused on something constantly happening and an ongoing sense of threat than the first one, which really allows more exploration of Luke. Now, the movie is two hours and two minutes long without end credits, and two hours, seven and a half minutes long with them. It's well worth the investment of time. If you're not invested, maybe 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. The best element of the movie is the darkness and depth. It adds to what the first movie delivered without feeling too different. Like, it still feels like we're watching the same overall series. And I would say it's worth watching the movie at least once just to experience that. And I, you know, if, if you don't have Disney Plus, or, you know, if you find a version you can buy that has a, a different cut than Disney Plus, I would say it's well worth owning this movie. So you can rewatch parts or the whole. I tried. I really tried to think of something truly negative 
about this movie that I felt like really like say, okay, there's this, you know, it doesn't ruin the movie, but it, it's, I, I don't know, I, I, some things haven't aged super well, I guess that's probably the, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's the worst thing I have to say about this movie, and that's really not a, as, as you can probably tell already, that's really not a big deal, like, yeah, some things haven't aged well, I, I saw one person say that they found the dialogue frustrating because, and, and these are their words, not mine, in the 80s, every movie you know, it was constantly people arguing with each other. I could see what they mean. I don't. I don't think it's a problem for the movie. And I saw someone point out that some of the lines Han, you know, says, especially to Leia, are very reminiscent of stuff that you know, Bogey Humphrey Bogart might have said to like Lauren Bacall or something, and. You know, that does, of course, there are some things that were deemed, you know, yeah, there are some things in there that come across as problematic today. Now, the worst aspect, according to others, some people say that it's too silly, and I, I can understand where they're coming from. I just, I don't think it's a big deal, but... Yeah, you know, if, if you don't like silliness in movies, especially in ones that are overall as mature as this, then, you know, just temper your expectations. No going into it, there's going to be some silliness. Now, before the first time I watched this movie, the thing I was most worried about was that it would feel like a rehash, that George Lucas just didn't have enough new ideas for a whole other movie, and the movie exceeded my expectations. It really doesn't feel like a rehash of A New Hope. I was most looking forward to seeing more of the world that the first one introduced us to, and again, the movie exceeded my expectations. And let's see. Yeah, I think... Yeah, so the movie is definitely entertaining to watch and just Brief spoiler note, not really details about the end. Yeah, spoiler for some of the ending. The last few parts of the movie are saddening to watch. No more spoilers. And yeah, you know, the movie is good as a whole, not only in parts. It leaves some unanswered questions, and that's a good thing because the answers are in the next movie, Return of the Jedi. And yeah, the trailers do give away too much. The let's see, the one minute eleven second one, the two minute seven second one, and the one minute fifty second one, but. The trailers also do give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailers, you're very likely to like the movie, and vice versa. The cover and posters do not give away too much and give you a good idea of what the movie is like. Now, the movie does not have a lot of metaphors, difficult to understand elements, there is some depth, and it definitely, like, the, there's definitely some really interesting, intelligent ideas here. It's not a movie you need to watch more than once, and really all you need to know and understand before watching the movie in order to fully appreciate it, uh, the events of and concepts introduced in episode four. But yeah, the you get much more of a sense of what the force is in this, where in the first one they kept it very vague. And part of that is that there just wasn't time to dive that deep into it. There's so much else going on. But you know, here we have two parallel storylines, 
and one of them is specifically about the force so yeah you get a lot more in this one now let's see. so yeah the when I searched on YouTube for videos you know I, I just did a I searched using other keywords yeah using keywords and the words Empire Strikes Back and I found 541 and a half minutes worth of YouTube videos so yeah some people had things to say about this movie and there's a lot of really good videos out there about it I I really enjoyed watching yeah this has a 94 percent on the tomato meter based on 105 reviews and a 97 percent audience score based on over a quarter million ratings so basically yeah the the of the 105 reviews 99 of them are fresh only six are rotten and the movie is certified fresh dark sinister and ultimate i'm briefly gonna read the critics consensus dark sinister but ultimately even more involving than a new hope the empire strikes back defies viewer expectations and takes the series to heightened emotional levels and the average user rating was 4.6 out of 5 and on Metacritic it has an 82 out of 100 for critics and 9.0 out of 10 for users and the last user reviews that I found were from August 4 of this year but I haven't checked in weeks so it's possible someone has put in but yeah when I looked there were 266 user reviews and 25 Metacritic reviews and on IMDb it has an 8.7 out of 10 and 1,329 IMDb user reviews and there were links to 237 reviews in IMDb's external reviews section and yeah this is capital C cinema not only junk food I recommend this to anyone who liked A New Hope and you know if you if you don't currently have Disney Plus but you're passionate about Star Wars all the Star Wars films and I think all of the shows are on Disney Plus now on Disney Plus it does not have that many extras there's 14 minutes of very varying visual quality deleted scenes and yeah you know that's that's really not very much compared to yeah, I, I usually compare it to the MCU, but here we can just compare it to the to A New Hope, where there was a lot of stuff. I, I don't remember the exact number of minutes worth, but it was a lot. And, you know, deleted scenes, documentary stuff, and just very, yeah. But I do appreciate that, like, I'm, I'm glad that I could see the deleted scenes, even though some of them, you know, the, the visual quality, like, the, the film wasn't processed because they weren't going to use it, and it's expensive. To, you know, you have to pay for all the film you process. So, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't been, what's it called? They didn't take as much care to protect this film, but they're they're fun. The you know yeah the deleted scenes are fun, and yeah, I rate this ten lessons by the wise Jedi Master out of ten, 
And that brings us to the thoughts sections. Hmm. At exactly the one hour mark. The one hour Hamel mark. Thought section start, disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. Now, so, so yeah, from here on out, in case you skip to here, from here on out, spoilers, I will not, I'll, I'll only warn if I spoil anything other than A New Hope or Empire Strikes Back. I'm really glad that this is a sequel. This is one of those sequels where the movie, like, if you went into this movie, you know, I doubt very many people walk into this movie blindly, you know, not, not in 1980, not any time since then because it's so easy to find out that it's not the first it's not the start of the story and the movie doesn't spend any time summing up you know like if if you tried to watch this and you didn't know what happened or or maybe you forgot if a long time passed between you know yeah, the movie expects you to know that stuff, and you might be confused if not. And because of that, they, they're they able to achieve a depth to the characters that just, yeah, that relies on us knowing the characters. And we see very early on that they're still in roughly the same place that they were at the end of A New Hope. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say I loved every line they put in the IMDb quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. So yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MSC3A riff tracks and other jokes. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I had while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting of like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I mean, I suppose Darth Vader is probably the least likable. I don't know, I, I suppose some people... I always thought that Lando... I agree that it is a betrayal of Han's trust, but it does seem to me that it was the only way to have a chance at saving Han. Like, if, if Lando had said no to Vader, Vader would have had him killed and just, you know, the trap would have been set up slightly differently, but, you know... Vader was already there. It's not like there, there could have been a battle between Vader's forces and Lando's forces, and Lando might have won, but Lando just said, no, 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 we're just going to work with him instead. I would definitely say the movie has empathy for Lando. I think it does have a little for Vader as well. The, that shot of the his his head... I would say there's some, you know, part of it is also that's creepy, but there is a sense of vulnerability there. And I think it was the, the right choice. I think the fact that we have a little bit of hope for Vader, given that this movie ends with the realization that he's Luke's father, like, it would have been way too saddening if the movie ended with you know, Luke possibly becoming this completely, 
Yeah, hor horribly evil. Yeah. I appreciate that this one, you know, Leia is still really badass and smart. And, you know, there, there are several things where she points out that someone, that there's something wrong. You know, she, she says to Han, C-3PO has been missing, as, as yeah, see, it's been too long since we last saw C-3PO for him to just have gotten lost. Which is, you know, quite good, because, yeah, if he was just lost, then he would have found someone to ask, and they would have sent him on in the right direction. But too much time has, has passed for, you know, without that happening, for it to still be the case. And I think the movie does a really great job not overexposing the threat. Like, we don't spend that much... We, we actually don't see the Wampa that much. Boba Fett also really doesn't have a lot of screen time, so he remains really mysterious. Vader, despite a decent amount of screen time, is much more intense and sinister. I think... That covers now. My making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, me wanting to make a light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to MSC 3K and overanalyze everything I watch. And that brings us to the next section notes taken while watching Luke getting attacked by the Wampa less than five minutes in really establishes how much more dangerous and dark this movie's version of the Star Wars galaxy is compared to the first one there were alien creatures threatening or outright attacking good guy characters in the first one but they were stuff like the creature in the garbage disposal And let's see. Yes, uh, sand people, and then the there were those two that threatened Luke in the Star Wars Cantina. The Wampa is roughly the size of all of the aforementioned combined, and then some. Well, the part of the creature in the garbage disposal that we see. I suppose it's possible that it's much bigger and. You know, and that one may well be as strong as the Wampa, but being grabbed by the leg from something you don't see, you know, that, that is kind of, that, that, it's, it's creepy, it's uncomfortable, but being bashed in the head with a massive paw is much more scary and intense. And like, straight up, you know, he's riding around and it looks fine, and then suddenly this, massive ball just right in his face and and in the the ah i'm afraid i forget what the thing he right it's not a bantha that he rides right i'm i'm not expecting you to somehow be able to respond to where i could hear it while i'm recording i'm just thinking out loud yeah i'm afraid i do not remember what the thing he rides is called but yeah you know the thing the Wampa kills both of them. Actually, come to think of it, I guess it's the the thing he was riding on. That's what that's what we see the Wampa eating when Luke comes to. So it really is like if he doesn't get free almost immediately, he is going to be food for that thing. I do really appreciate that now Han is clearly concerned about Luke. When in the first one, you know. Since they had just met and they had some significant disagreements, you know, Han doesn't believe in the Force. Luke, like, has a a good amount of faith in in the the Force, and you know, 
Yeah, they argued. Han was angry with him several times. Like he literally threatened. You know, he's he said something like, "If you say something like that about the Falcon again, you'll be floating home." You know, but the the you know when this movie starts, they've spent years working together. Han cares about the rebellion. Luke already did care about the rebellion. So now they have that in common. So that is a, a great, yeah. Obviously, it's fortunate for the safety of the Star Wars galaxy that Luke is still alive. But when you think about it, the fact that the Wampa didn't immediately kill him, but instead suspended him from his feet is legitimately scary. Like, how long was he going to hang up? hang up there before it starts eating him we know it eats flesh we see it right before he uses the force to get the lightsaber back and actually the fact that it hangs him upside down like it doesn't hang him by his hands for example so that and again you know it's fortunate for otherwise the movie wouldn't happen the way it does but that is like the the him hanging upside down means it's more likely that he'll be awake and aware when it starts attacking him again you know when yeah when it comes to eat him yeah they they thought of some really great details there now And, and really, like, if he hadn't gotten the, the lightsaber into his hand, like, right then and there, when he does, and, you know, and, and cut the Wampa's arm off, it would have been able to subdue him again, and, like, maybe this time, like, you know, I, I, I could imagine it might start eating him almost immediately. Now, C-3PO and R2-D2 are both really worried about Luke with, you know, R2-D2 scanning for him. C-3PO asserts, of course Luke is, will see Luke again, and he'll be alright. You know, he's basically trying to will that to be true. C-3PO is not trying to upset or scare Leia, but the things that he says about Luke's chances of survival are not very encouraging. <laughs> Just like, and it's again, it's such a great detail, you know, the, the rebel, I don't know if he's, let's go with officer, the rebel officer points out to Leia, we have to sh close the shield doors, you know, it's like it, it, if they didn't have, a, you know, some, something like that in there. There would be people saying, how do they keep the the cave from being overrun with, like, dangerous animals like wampas, which, actually, there's a deleted scene where there are wamp there, there are some wampas in, in, a, in one room in, in the, the tunnels. And actually, yeah, I think at first they, like, start attacking, and then, like, what's the word, the... I forget exactly who, but I think someone manages to get them into a room and then the lock the door so they can't get out. And C-3PO rips, the, 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 and there's the, this sign on the front of it that says, Beware Wampas. And C-3PO rips off the sign and then walks away. And, like, at least one snowtrooper, like, opens the door and walks in and is killed before he can get back out. I like that just as the vision of Ben fades into nothing, Han rides from the exact same direction. I can't help but wonder if Ben could sense that Han was coming from there, and like in in part he's, you know, yeah, he's he's making sure to get his message to Luke something that will also give Luke hope and make it easier for him to keep fighting to survive. He has something more to fight for. 
I like that when C-3PO says that Luke is in good health, he uses the term fully functional. He's so used to talking about robots. With fairly simple visuals and audio, we get the sense that the probe droid is a source of danger. Not because it itself is powerful, but because once it finds the good guys, so does the Empire's military force. I always love hearing the Imperial March. It's I've 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 literally never in my life heard that played and been like, I don't want to listen to that right now. Like there's probably at least some bad Star Wars parodies out there that use the song and or the piece of music. And even then I was like, okay, this could be worse. Luke and Chewie saying goodbye to each other is a lot like a dog and not necessarily the owner but a friend of his owner like Luke scratches him behind the the ear and Chewie like grabs him with both like it, it's like a, a dog jumping up at its owner or a friend of its owner or you know there's there's this video of Chris Evans like you know lying on the on the floor and his dog being all over him so that's yeah that's the kind of thing it makes me think of i love leia giving orders to the pilots such confidence and authority and what she's saying makes sense and i really love seeing them trip the the walker and it's also just like I already mentioned, Shadows of the Empire. The the you know I only ever played the demo. I I read that the rest of the game isn't that good, and I I don't even know how what what is the rest of the game. I I guess they had to make up a bunch of stuff. I'm not sure I can think of anything else in the movie that they could really be. And anyway, but yeah, you know, tripping walkers is, is fun. And you've also got like Star Wars Battlefront 2. I forget about 1. I'm not sure it's in 1, but that there it does require two players. So, but uh, right, heh. I'm talking about the original Star Wars Battlefront. I'm not talking about the new ones. I'm talking about the two games from, let's see if I can recall, 2000 and... One and five, is that it? 2000, so, something like that. I haven't played the new ones. I hear that they're bad, even beyond the really awful exploitative loot box stuff. And one of the rebel officers questions Leia's order, but does accept that she's right. It's really intense when Luke crash lands in the walker's path. We see how massive, we, we get this really great effective close-up of this, you know, just, it fills the frame. And Luke gets out of the cockpit just in time before the ship is crushed behind him. Another original trilogy movie, another scene where Darth Vader makes an entrance right after Stormtroopers. In this case, Snoke Troopers, Snoke Troopers, not Snoke Troopers, I guess Snoke Troopers are the military force sent out by Snopes.com to clear the internet of false information. That's, now, now that's a military I can get behind. But yeah, the Snoke Troopers, Snow Troopers, there it is, cleared the path for him. And Han gets the Falcon in the air right before Vader reaches them. Like, he, Vader gets there just in time to see them fly off. I mean, based on how much of a badass he is in this movie, in, in the lightsaber duel, for example, with Luke at the end of this movie, if Vader had gotten just a little bit closer, there's some chance that he could have stopped it with, like, telekinesis, maybe also using his lightsaber. Like, when... I had honestly forgotten when uh, that the in in the lightsaber duel at the end of this movie, Vader like like 
dives towards Luke at one point. Like, yeah, if he, if he, like, dives and grabs the, the Falcon with telekinesis and, like, starts crushing important parts of it, yeah, that's, that's it. You know, movie over the, the, or the, the uh, rather, well, yeah, yeah, I guess after that he would start torturing Han and Leia, maybe by showing them Jedi. I couldn't help it. It was too, it was too easy of a joke. Anyway, yeah, you know, Vader would start torturing them so that Luke would leave Dagobah. Yeah, the movie would end much, much sooner. And after we briefly see Luke heading to Dagobah, we see that the Falcon is going to have to get past the Star Destroyers and TIE Fighters. I mean, we weren't surprised, but it's still awesome to see. Shut him up or shut him down? What? No, left or right? Ah, he doesn't want to get political. I see. Asteroid language! I know you're upset, but there, you know, there are droids present. I don't know. In in my, I I could, I feel like R two D two at at least some of the time behaves kind of like a child. I I feel like there's some chance that, although apparently like the original script for A New Hope, he spoke English and apparently swore like a sailor. So, I don't know. They enter the asteroid field and. You know, we see this one TIE fighter destroyed, flying into an asteroid. The movie underlines, this is, in fact, extremely dangerous. I had forgotten, but for sure some of the scene of them flying through the asteroid field is what that scene in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, what is it called? The Quantum Asteroid Field? Something like that. Is based on, you know, obviously, the, you know, CG had gotten a lot better so they could make it move much faster but I still love this movie's scene as well and Luke crashes onto Dagobah partially burying the ship in the swamp he is substantially less confident about the situation now than he was right before then and R2 is grabbed by the large swamp creature I'm guessing the swamp creature spat R2-D2 out because when it grabbed him, it assumed he was a biological creature. There's not a lot of tech. There's, yeah, there's not a lot of protein in this astro droid. There, it, yeah, it's not used to having to to be careful not to accidentally ingest like droids and such since there's so little technology on Dagobah. I really love the shot of Vader's helmet covering his exposed head again. There's so much going on that we're told you know, yeah, there's so much going on there. We're told that he isn't pure robot. There's a vulnerability to vulnerability to it, but it's also really creepy looking, you know. Like, if you only watch the first movie, you might think that he is just a robot. You know, like the... the. I mean, I, I realize they say in the first one, you know, he's more... Yeah, Ben says he's more machine now than man. But the fact that, like... And especially because it's his head, like, not, like, I don't know, his knee or something... Just we we think of the the human head as something like uniquely, you know, which is also why like a, a number of movies, if they want to show something scary, they'll show something being done to someone's head or face or something. I feel like feel like what? Like we're being watched. I mean, if Yoda was going to attack him, he would not have given away the element of surprise like that. 
I figured he was probably ready to use telekinesis to stop the blast if Luke from from Luke's blaster if he started shooting, maybe even grab the weapon out of his hand with telekinesis. And it's it's a nice kind of like Yoda isn't really trying to hide. You know, he's again, he just he just gave away that he was there. And it's it's this kind of quirky way of revealing himself instead of like a you know proper introduction of like you know yeah he's he's sitting there watching them which immediately makes you think he's this you know what what is this weird old hermit doing you know you don't think of him as a jedi master but then ben was introduced like what's the word whooping i guess and you know in a way to scare off the sand people so yeah, I guess they for these movies they like to introduce good guy Jedi by showing them doing something that makes you think they might be they might you know at the very least not Jedi not not yeah Han doesn't want to admit to C three PO that C three PO knew more about the ship than him so he whisper yells to Jude and he's like. I know we have to replace the, you know, and he walks a couple of steps and like looks back. Okay, he can't hear me. You can't hear him. Um, uh, Chewy, we should we should probably replace the the thing. You know, poor R two D two stuck outside Yoda's little hut in the rain. We never actually we're never told why. I mean, if it's big enough for Yoda. Isn't it big enough for R2-D2? But there's not a lot of room in there, so maybe that's it. And certainly R2-D2 isn't going to be eating, which is what the others are doing in there. Maybe Yoda hasn't forgiven him for, like, trying to grab the, what was it, the lamp, I think? Yoda was trying to take the little lamp thing, and, you know, R2-D2 just sticks the the little thing out and grabs it and tries to yank it and then Yoda like starts smacking him with the his stick yeah and that is again like if you look you know when you rewatch the movie when you know that that's Yoda and you 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 know you notice things that he's saying or doing that are there to test him because what you like Ideally, a Jedi should have patience and tolerance for even really difficult to deal with beings, you know. And, and Yoda, like, he takes his food, he rummages around in his stuff, he tries to take something from him. And, like, I, I, I guess if... if Luke was like a model Jedi Padawan. You know, when once Yo once he meets Yoda and Yoda starts like grabbing his food, maybe Luke should be saying like we can trade. I can trade you some of my food. You know, perhaps you know where Yoda is. If you could help me bring me to Yoda or bring him to me you can have some of my food or you know the the, the lamp you know I, yeah Yoda is basically saying how would he react if I tried taking his food what if I took one of his tools like seeing is he gonna like stop and say you want something that I have and I want something that you have let's you know make this work but yeah you know Luke like, if Luke knew that it was Yoda, the moment that he realizes it's Yoda, he completely changes in how he talks to him. But, yeah, it, it, it's a clever test. You know, the, the... I'm not a huge fan of Mission Impossible 3, but there is that line in it that's quite clever. You learn a lot about a person 
by looking at how he treats people that he doesn't have to treat well. And Yoda reels to Luke that he is the Jedi Master Luke is looking for. And Yoda, like, verbally picks apart, you know, he says, you're always looking to the horizon. You, you know, all these things. He, he nails it. He's impatient. He never focuses on what he's currently doing. He's always looking for something different that he's, than what he's currently facing. You know, if, if you look at the, the first movie, that really is, like, you can understand it when he's, like, he wants to leave the farm and he wants to, you know, find out more about his father and all these things. But when you really stop and think about it, I mean, if he doesn't get those kinds of urges under control, that can be a problem like that. If, if he is in a dangerous situation and he can't focus on the situation, if his mind is elsewhere, yeah. You know, when we watched the first movie before watching this one, those traits didn't bother us. But now we do see how it is very un-Jedi-like. It's such a, such a clever, you know, the movie comments on the types, the archetypes we see in the first movie. Which again, you know, if if the if the first movie is the only one you watch, then it just works well that there are archetypes. But the moment that you make a sequel, you have to do something interesting, something different. I think there's a there's a chance that this would have been the last, or maybe not the very last, but the last successful Star Wars movie if it really didn't do anything different from A New Hope. It's very clever that Han accidentally landed inside the, for the, for the movie, not for his character. Land inside the mouth of this creature, and then when the TIE bombers drop bombs near it, these much smaller creatures start landing on different parts of the Falcon. They were probably rattled by the explosions. They're not trying to scare the crew of the Falcon, but they are trying to find a safe place to be, and they happen to scare the crew of the Falcon. Like, they probably... At, at first, they probably barely even register that there are living people there. I, I guess it depends on their eyesight, but, you know, and and once you see the, the giant space snake, you know, if you look at how big it is compared to how small the flying things that they faced when they left the Falcon, I mean, that's basically like, you know, Quite a few living things have some form of bacteria or, or, ah, I feel, I think it's bacteria. I'm pretty sure it's bacteria, you know, living in different parts of our bodies, including our mouths, you know, so it's that creature's mouth bacteria, basically. They really do just barely make it out of the snake, space snake, before it closes its mouth. You can't possibly tell me that you would not close your mouth if some like if something in your throat starts to hurt, you know, you, you like try to clear your throat, you know, and that's that's basically what it's doing. What's in there? Only what you take with you. Your weapons. Okay, I can do better than that. Only what you take with you. Your weapons. You will not need them. I feel like I can do better, but I'm gonna... Yeah. I used to have a pretty decent Yoda impersonation. Anyway, Luke doesn't fully believe or understand Yoda, so he keeps his weapons on him, and he goes in there full of hatred for the dark side instead of trying to clear his mind of negative thoughts he goes in there thinking the dark side means evil people with force powers like Darth Vader so that's exactly what he finds you know before Yoda said yeah when, when Yoda says you have to go into that cave he says it is strong with the dark side and 
to Luke, Dark Side means Darth Vader. So that's what he, you know, if he walked in there with without feeling a lot of, you know, fear of and, and hatred towards, yeah, you know, it, it wouldn't have gone the way, it wouldn't have gone down the way that it did. It's a great subtle detail that you may not catch on your first viewing that Luke ignites his lightsaber before, I'm going to call him Dream Vader, does. Hypothetically, if Luke hadn't ignited his lightsaber, Dream Vader might not have either, since this is a projection of his anxieties. And seeing the face of Luke when Dream Vader is killed is great foreshadowing. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. On some level, Luke did know that he was related to Vader, and if you're becoming like Vader, the, you know, the idea that it's an ingrown quality, and, and like, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's again, it's so clever. In the first movie, the idea that, you know, like, yeah, Luke is told, your father was a great Jedi Master. You could be like him. He wanted that for you. And, you know, here's this this old guy that could help make that happen. You know, the the I saw someone point out that Luke has a much stronger emotional reaction to Ben Kenobi dying than to finding his aunt and uncle's charred bodies. And I think an argument could be made that he should have had at least a slightly stronger reaction than he does in the finished film to his aunt and uncle being dead. But I do think that it is in character for him that he he does care more about the idea of who his father was and the chance of him becoming his father or like his father. He cares more about that than he does his aunt and uncle who he finds kind of frustrating but yeah, you know, when you're when you're young and you there's this idea that you you know you you look up to your your parents and you idol, idealize them and you want to become like them when you grow up, you know, and then in this one you have the the flip side of that realizing that your parents are flawed. Now not everybody's parent is you know a, a Sith lord or Sith Lady, but I'm trying to think of how I can make a pun out of Sith Lady Sith. I can't quite, maybe I'll think of something later, but everybody's parents has flaws, and when you realize that your parents have flaws, you start to worry about yourself ending up with those you know yeah so it's it's a very clever you know gradually he's maturing and i'm not going to go into details about the you know return of the jedi in this video but the third movie does continue on that theme it's you know even more mature in how it views uh, yeah it's very clever of Han to fly directly at the Star Destroyer and then hiding on it. Everybody knows the Millennium Falcon would not stand a chance in a direct assault on a Star Destroyer. That's exactly why Han can take the Star Destroyer personnel by surprise. The military of the Galactic Empire can't tell that he hides the Falcon because it requires real out-of-the-box thinking and the Galactic Empire military are too convinced of their superiority. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Just a few minutes after Han says they're going to Bespin, Luke sees them in Bespin in pain. So we do have a sense that things might go wrong. Right after Han tells Leia they'll be fine, he then tells Chewie, watch out.
Luke, I don't want to lose you to the dark side of the Force the way I lost Vader. And once you watch the entire movie and know that Vader is his father, that makes, you know, yeah, that bit makes even more sense. He's literally worried that Luke is that much like his father. And that's also, that's part of why Luke doesn't think that he'll fail. Because he's one of the good guys. Vader's one of the bad guys. Vader fell for the dark side, but he's a bad guy. Luke is a good guy, so he's not going to fall for it. But then once he realizes, you know, we are of the same blood, we're father and son. Yeah, it does bring up, you know... Might he become, like, yeah. And Lando invites them all to dinner. You know, I, I love, like, Lando basically comes in and says, Leia, I'd love to take you out. And and Han is like, yeah, I, I bet you would. I'm sure you would love that. And and then Lando's like, oh, you're, you're all invited, of course. And, like, Han and Chewie are like, he is not going to steal Leia away from Han, you know, but... That just makes it easier to capture all of them at once. So he's he's playing on the on that jealousy, which also like Lando did. Vader told Lando that the, the let's see what was the one thing. Yeah, Vader. If if I recall, Lando says that Vader told him the only thing. Like, yeah, they're going to keep Han and Leia there for a while and, and like, scare them, but only so that it'll attract Luke, you know, and then he'll let the, the others go. Luke is the only one that he wants, and Lando doesn't have an emotional connection to Luke. You know, Leia and Han wouldn't have given a, up Luke like that, but Lando doesn't have any emotional connection. He does have an emotional connection to all the people he's responsible for on Bespin, you know, so, yeah. And, let's see, the, yeah, you know, so, now that I've explained, I, I do think that Lando, you know, he, he tried to be as tactical about it as he could with dealing with, with Vader, he wanted all of them to get captured in one spot because he thought that most of them would be released anyway. So if they start shooting, they might get shot themselves. And if they're split up, there's more of a chance of fighting. My happiness with there finally being at least one black guy in the Star Wars Galaxy by this point in the, you know, when the movies came out chronologically, is somewhat tempered by the fact that they chose to have the one black guy betray the white people. There's a negative stereotype about black people, you know, that, that white people can't trust them, and that white women are especially at risk of black men, and they keep playing up how he's trying to seduce Leia. Just, yeah. The torture device for Han looks appropriately scary but it does look like it would leave visible marks on him which it doesn't I have always found that to be straining for Julie I'm not asking for the movie to adhere to the same rules as our universe but we know that the Star Wars galaxy does allow for people to get visibly hurt you know, like, in this movie alone, we, we see that Luke's face gets slightly messed up by the Wampa hitting him. You know, I, I feel like there would be, a, yeah, there would be some mark on him. I don't know, I guess, you know, his, his rugged good looks are part of the movie's appeal. If you put him in there, it might kill him. Fine, we'll ta ta taste it. We'll test it on Captain Solo. No good deed goes unpunished, Lando. You know, Lando's like, look, I, I, I want this deal to work out. I don't want you to suddenly decide that I tricked you into killing the your your you know the Emperor's big prize. So, I'm just saying, I don't know if it'll work. And then suddenly, okay, sure, 
will we'll, you know maybe it'll kill Han Solo. I love the lightsaber duel at the end of the movie. It's sweet how much C-3PO does clearly care about R2-D2 when they're finally reunited for the first time since the very start of the movie. The first time you watch the movie, you really aren't sure if Luke is going to get out of the carbon freezing chamber in time. If Han got frozen, Luke might as well, might be as well. And we've just seen Boba Fett fly off with Han, so we, you know... Again, like, up to the very end of the movie, like, you're still holding out hope. They're gonna... No, no, no. It's, it's Star Wars. It's Star Wars. We watched the entire first movie. It looks dark. They'll win in the end. That's how this goes. You know, they'll they'll be able to catch... They'll, they'll stop Boba Fett's ship. And then they'll thaw out Han. But no, he, he goes off flying and... Yeah. And Darth Vader tells Luke that he is Luke's father genuinely believing that this will make Luke more likely to follow him. After all, if even his father is willing to join the dark side, maybe he should as well. And Luke does legitimately choose to let himself fall, not knowing what, if anything, he will land on. To Luke, death is preferable to joining the dark side. And there at the end, you know, the Falcon is you know, flying around, the, the being shot at by the Empire, and Vader uses the Force to communicate with Luke, still trying to convince him to join, and Luke is overcome with the sense of betrayal that Ben didn't tell him the truth. And that brings us... So the final section, notes taken before watching. You know, Lando very quickly slips out of Vader's grasp because he's just that smooth. Billy Dee Williams is awesome. I've... I, he's, he's incredible in everything I've seen him in. Like, I have not got very many positive things to say about let's see what was it even called I, I played the first chunk of command and conquer games regardless of the franchise and continuity and such i forget exact i, do, I don't currently regard, tiberium wars i think it's called tiberium wars and yeah billy d williams appears in a bunch of the briefing videos if you play as gdi and yeah, he's he's really good there. You know, it's not I don't have that many positive things to say about that game, but he's always really entertaining. I love how dark this movie is, including the ending. The first time you watch the ending, you legitimately have no idea how the next movie is going to resolve it. And I'm not going to be spoiling how it does in this video. I mentioned in my review of the first one that George Lucas wanted to recreate the serial, like the old Flash Gordon shorts. This movie follows it in that respect, and th this movie does in fact have a cliffhanger, cliffhanger ending of the kind that those shorts would end. And... Yeah, it, it is one of those things, you know, you're, you're basically supposed to be completely baffled as to how it could possibly work out in favor of the good guys. In the last several scenes, the first time you watch them, you keep hoping against hope that things will work out well, and it is incredibly impactful the very first time you watch it, and even on repeat viewings, just how bad the situation is at the very ending. And I really like, I, I've seen some people say, oh, you know, the movie doesn't have an ending. I would agree if it just ended with, like, you know, Luke is, is hanging on there. He, he gets, he, he telepathically communicates with Leia. They pick him up. Boom. Credits. But, there, you know, right before the, the, you know, between that and credits, we see Luke getting a robotic hand. We, you know, let's see. Is it Lando who says, I, yeah, I, I have to admit, I, I forget who says it, but 
Lando or Leia says that, you know, they're going to look for where Han is. Once they find him, they're going to contact the other. And and then they can make sure to, to go and rescue him. You know, it it's true that it's not a completely conclusive ending, but I, I really don't agree with people who say that it just doesn't have an ending at all. I, I feel like that's an exaggeration. Maybe that's intentional. I really like that Luke actually does not make a difference by going to Cloud City. Like, imagine if he didn't show up, you know, Han, and uh, not Han, Leia, La Lando, Chewie, and the droids were already heading to the Falcon, you know, he doesn't save his friends. They end up having to save him. He ends up needing a robot, robotic prosthetic. Thankfully, the others felt like it's the thought that counts, so they do proceed to give the man a hand. The lightsaber duel at the end is incredible. It's a huge step up from the first one, which, to be fair, was being performed by an old man, and I read somewhere that, like, David Prowse had trouble seeing through the helmet. He, he had, you know, it wasn't a huge problem if he was just supposed to walk and, and gesture and say, you know, say things with impact. But when he's like waving this thing around, you know, it's, it, he's trying to, he's struggling to, to see through the, the eye holes. And so it's just, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I already mentioned, I already talked some about Va Dream Vader in the cave. Yeah, you know, first, yeah, when the actual Vader tells Luke, you know, he's Luke's father, you start to wonder if it's even possible to avoid becoming evil. Before that, we thought of the light and dark side of the Force as separate. Only evil people are seduced by the dark side, but here we are forced to think of it differently. We've accepted Luke as good since basically the moment we met him. Like, when you meet him in the first movie, you, you might think he's annoying when you first meet him, but you definitely don't think he's evil. You know, he's, he's essentially an innocent. We've been certain that Darth Vader was pure evil since the moment we met him. You know, up until the ending of this movie, we thought that he murdered Luke's good father. No one really claims that Luke's father, Anakin, was not good before he died, so he went from being a good person to being an evil person. Does that mean that Luke will as well? You know, Yoda said... Yeah, Yoda hints that this is what would happen if Luke left before his training was over. And we, the audience, are like, holy crap, might Luke become as powerful and evil as Darth Vader? It's such a club, because it really, like, you would think the movie's going to end with Luke heroically defeating Vader in the, you know, with the, the lightsaber, and he's going to help his friends get free, He's going to stop Boba Fett before uh, Boba Fett flies off with Han Solo. You know, all this stuff. And just the, the movie completely subverts your expectations without being unsatisfying. I think it would have been unsatisfying if there hadn't been a lightsaber duel. And, you know, you might think, well, how can Luke even fight? He was a farmer. He, he when, when did he learn you know, fencing, but the, the, I, f I figure, I mean, he's had the lightsaber for years now. He, he was given the lightsaber by Ben and he's known that Vader's out there and likes to fight with lightsabers. So I figure, you know, maybe like we know that there was this, that training thing that he could use to learn how to deflect blast laser blasts blaster blast anyway maybe there's one that like 
helps train you for fencing and maybe he's spent a few hours every day doing that i i feel like that works i, I don't think we have to see it it's just it it's good that there is room for that to be the case i usually don't like when continuity is messed with but i have to admit i'm really glad in the case of this and with a number of mcu retcons when it occurred to you know for this movie george lucas that the movie would be better if it turned out that darth vader actually is luke's father i'm really glad that he didn't stop and say mm, but that means that ben was lying to luke when he said that darth vader killed his father even though that is 100 percent a result of this change the movie would be a much less Im would be much less impactful if not for that twist and it's great that we briefly see what Vader looks like under the helmet. It's the first time we get a sense that there is any fragility to him, and it makes us wonder if he could be redeemed. I really love the first test that Yoda puts Luke through. If Luke is too impatient and Yoda gives him a lot of power, Yoda will be partially responsible if Luke gives in to his negative impulses and uses the power for evil. A good Jedi would be patient with Yoda. Luke has a difficult time in dealing with Yoda until he realizes that he's talking to this important Jedi Master. He thought he was just an annoying person, slowing him down from reaching his great destiny. I love the realization that accidentally landed the Millennium Falcon inside the mouth of a giant space snake. I don't know the extended universe stuff, so there, it's possible that there is a specific explanation for it. I'm guessing that thing is basically like a Venus flytrap. You know, it, it lures you in, opens its mouth. It looks like it's a, you know, yeah. Like, a lot of animals would be attracted to this big cave, so they would enter, and then once it senses, oh, there's something, there's something good, and what's it called organic there it closes its mouth and eats the the thing that was in there and the reason that it didn't do that with the falcon was because it couldn't tell like it, it could maybe tell that there was something there but it didn't like it couldn't tell that there was anything organic there because what landed on its tongue in its mouth was the the falcon this mechanical you know yeah of a vehicle and let's yeah i really love vader saying we would be honored if you would join us but then he has a lot of excellent lines in this people say that luke should have stayed inside after the af inside the cave after cutting off the arm of the wampa the way I see it, how could he be sure that there's only one? Given how insanely cold the climate there is, it would make a lot of sense for them to live in packs so they can help each other. For all we know, there's a dozen of those things in there, and they will... Yeah, they, you know, they will come out, they will have, ironically, zero chill when one of them is wounded. That's a significant threat to the pack. They need all hands on deck here. And just because they no longer have the drop on them doesn't mean that they're no longer dangerous. You know, an animal is at its very most dangerous when it's wounded and or cornered, and here it would be both. So, yeah. Now... Yeah, I'm just briefly going to read the... Very few people knew before the movie premiered the, you know, that Darth Vader was... You know, that the twist was that Darth Vader was Luke's father. Or is... Yeah, in the, in the movie, is his father. You know, the, the obviously... 
the the you know Mark Hamill knew so that his acting performance could be in response to that. James Earl Jones obviously had to be told since he was recording the voice, and he actually thought that Darth Vader was lying about it. And yeah, some of the the writers, director Kirshner and such, but. The line that David Prowse said when he was on set performing as Darth Vader was, Obi-Wan killed your father. And that's very clever because that would also have been shocking. You know, it's like, it's not like they had David Prowse say, you know, I didn't kill your father. Your father was an octopus. Then it'd be like, what? what? That doesn't make any sense. But no, Obi-Wan killed your father then then you're like wait does that mean that is i mean let's let's let me let's let's go off on this just briefly hypothetically if obi-wan killed luke skywalker's father then darth vader killing obi yeah killing ben maybe he was avenging luke's father you know maybe he's actually one of the good guys you know it it completely flips everything. It's it's such a fun, and I'm really glad. I'm really glad that that wasn't the twist. I much prefer Vader being his father to, yeah. But it's it's such a great. I'm not going to read it aloud, but I do just want to briefly say some some people's question: How could Vader and the Imperial forces arrive to Cloud City before Han, Leia? And the rest. Huh, I didn't realize the doctor was in this. Anyway, the most... Ah, right. I'm not going to read it out loud, but if you go to the IMDB Frequently Asked Questions or Fact section, there's a... You know, yeah, someone wrote it out. I think what they wrote makes perfect sense. And that is it. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two, one, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video if you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and or sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current. Disney Plus MCU show, you know, currently that is what if. Currently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more other videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.